Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. My guest today has already made quite the name for herself in only the two years that she's been in the industry. Please welcome model, femdom, dominatrix, and two-time Playboy cover model, Violet Boss. Hi. Oh my God. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. (laughs) You're welcome. I can say I knew that I was going to, you and I were going to like kind of vibe because I could tell from the beginning you were very organized. I You're am like a very type A queen. Yes, honey. I could tell. <laughs> type A personality. You're like, give me the directions. Mm-hmm. Here are my dates. Here's my information. You answered every question I sent you. You told me whether or not you were taking an Uber or mm-hmm. you were driving. Almost everyone skips that part. So yeah. I don't know if I have to give them parking. You were like, everything so yes. um on top of it oh my so. gosh, yeah. down to the detail you should see my house it's I completely it. perfectly organized Ugh. so that is how i have to live my life or else i will become a mess i try to be organized but my house is it's not a mess at all mm-hmm. but it is not perfect yeah i also live with like a husband who like yeah that does can not be a problem. like the clothes back in the drawers the way he's supposed to. You know, people who you have a perfectly folded drawer Mm -hmm. of shorts and instead of like taking this out, here's the pair of shorts that I want. And then putting these in, he goes like this and then just like spilling out the drawer on the floor. And I know I'm like, get your shit together. I cannot. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's annoying to me. Yeah. Maybe if I like whipped him a little bit, then that would, that would be, yeah. Maybe that'll get him into. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, I feel like, I feel like, no, I feel like like I've, I've given up. I've accepted my fate. don't get it. They don't. (laughs) No. (laughs) By the way, I do want to talk about how much I love your shirt. For those of you who are not watching this on the YouTube channel, you're listening. It says boys make great pets. (laughs) And it's two stick figures and one and the boy is on uh, all fours with a leash around his neck. And he yes. he looks kind of sad. He kind of does. Like, you don't need to be sad. I like, know. You better turn that into a smile, honey, is what I would say. I would say that your pets probably <laughs> love being your pet. Oh, they do. Yeah. They I mean, they're the, they come to you to be the pet. Oh, yeah. You, you better don't... be smiling 24 <laughs> 7. <laughs> is what I say. <laughs> well, we are definitely going to need to get into all of the dynamics of what you do, but let's, let's start at the beginning. So tell me about like your origins, how you ended up getting into the industry in the first place. Yeah. So kind of from an early age, I knew I wanted to be a model. It's actually funny because something like my mother and sister we would do every year was watch the Victoria's Secret fashion show. And like, I was obsessed. So it was like, I was around age seven or something. And my mother looks at me and she's like, what do you want to do when you grow up? I was like, hmm. I want to be a Victoria's Secret supermodel. And I was so serious. And like from that moment, like I knew I wanted to be a model. Although like leading up into growing up and being a teenager, a lot of people like kind of criticized me on that and made me feel like it wasn't something I could actually do. You know, you have to be stick thin. You have to be this and that. So kind of lost faith a little bit, but then I go to high school and I start modeling just like for my fashion blog. You had a fashion blog in high school? (laughs) I did. So I was a black sheep. I always have been, Um, but definitely in high school, I didn't really have friends or anything. And so I worked and I had my fashion blog and I made my sister take the photos. We had like a little Canon DSLR. And we go all over town and take photos and um Everyone made fun of me for it, but it was like super editorial, like black and white, super weird, but it was really fun. And so, yeah, that kind of happened for a few years and it made me realize how much I did enjoy modeling. So I was just trying to conceptualize how I could go about continuing to do that. So I went to New York City for college at the age of 18 And I thought I'd be getting into the fashion industry, um, but I ended up studying finance instead because I thought that was a safer bet for Mm. me. (laughs) Um, 
But yeah, around that time, I would do like, I would go out to all the clubs and parties. So I met a lot of people that were in the modeling industry and the, you know, kind of the greater um, adult industry. And so that was kind of my first like experience, even learning about what it was. So then I just kind of moved into dating and in that scene, like sugaring, Mm -hmm. I was trying to, uh, make a living in New York City while going to school without being supported by anyone, uh, but also like have fun and meet successful men. Mm. So I started sugaring and I did that for the whole like year and a half I was in New York. I've never heard that used as a verb, actually. (laughs) I make words up and like make them into verbs or however they fit like whatever I mean, I'm trying to say. It makes sense. It makes <laughs> sense. Um, So you were a sugar baby. Yes. Which means that you dated older successful men who like supported you financially. Yeah. I had a few different arrangements. Okay. Yeah. How, how did those work? Was it different for everybody? <sighs> Everyone was different. A lot of the men I saw would just like travel in. They didn't live in New York City. Um, So I would see them like once a month or, you know, once every three months. And then some I would see weekly. There was one that was really funny that was like he had this like $10,000 a month or something penthouse um, Mm -hmm. in Tribeca. And as a young college girl with no money, that was like very attractive to me. And he was like, I really want you to move in here. I'll take care of all your bills. You'll live here and go to school um, and you'll just be my full-time sugar baby. And I thought I wanted to do that, but then kind of had like this, you know, awakening moment of that's probably not the best (laughs) idea for me. And my friends knew that I was a sugar baby. So they were like, what are you doing? Like, get your act together. So I was like, okay, I won't go that far. I'll Mm -hmm. just go on dates and, you know, have shorter term arrangements with men. It just felt like too much of a commitment, huh? It did. I didn't really realize like what I was getting myself into. And I didn't want to get into, you know, a dangerous situation potentially Mm. uh, being so young and naive. Yeah. So I'm glad I didn't do that. But there are a lot of opportunities for, you know, arrangements like that, Mm -hmm. um, especially in New York City, where it's such a big thing or it was then. Can't speak to it now. So, yeah, I did that for about a year and a half. And then I moved home to Texas and uh, started just studying uh, for real estate because I stopped modeling and sugaring just for a little bit and wanted to focus on, you know, starting maybe a corporate career. And that didn't last very long. So I moved from the small town where my parents lived in central Texas and moved to Dallas and got a big girl job and decided that that wasn't enough. So I was going to sugar again because I was on all the dating sites and was going out with just regular guys. And I was like, yeah, this isn't cutting it for me. Like, (laughs) I was like, I miss going out to like the fancy restaurants and getting gifts and spoiled. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And that wasn't like just, you know, going to a dive bar and getting a drink just wasn't cutting it. So um, picked that up again while doing my corporate career. And I don't know, it was probably a few months back into sugaring. And then I met my now husband and there there was no intention between me or him to, I guess, um, you know, get into a serious relationship. It just kind of unfolded. But um, at that time, we were just like briefly seeing each other. I was modeling on the weekends uh, just with like kind of amateur photographers in the Dallas area, just getting my fix of that in. Were you on like Model Mayhem or like yeah. One Model Place? Uh-huh. Yeah, Model Mayhem. Yeah, still on that. I, the site. I can't believe that that site is still up. I know. And it's so dated. Yeah. <laughs> I think they kicked me off of that site. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people got kicked off of it they for kicked, whatever reason. I think they said that I was recruiting people for porn, but it was for Playboy. Yeah, that's And a, I was like, that's, that's literally, literally not the same so thing. Different. Like, are you crazy? <laughs> but yeah, I can't remember what the <gasps> argument was, but I've heard of that before. It's crazy. But yeah, so Model Mayhem and Instagram is where I found all the shoots. And then 
somehow ended up realizing that, you know, the guy I was seeing, aka my husband now, was a photographer and did glamour photography, which is exactly what I was shooting. And so he, you know, helped me realize and just kind of dive deeper into that because I expressed, you know, those feelings to him of wanting to be this bigger model, just to know how to navigate the waters of it. Mm-hmm. So I started doing that um, still while having my corporate career. And then that kind of fell apart in early 2022. Um, I was like a part of this massive layoff that made national news. And so it was kind of at that point where I was like, is this really something I want to consider doing? Like being in the corporate world. I hate, you know, having a boss and having a set schedule and just all the silly rules that come with it. And so after a few months of just kind of having off and thinking about it, I decided I was going to try to become a full-time independent model. And if it didn't work out, you know, worst case scenario can, you know, go back to the corporate world. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that was in about July of 2022. And then um, I ended up really enjoying it and figuring out a way to make it work financially. And are we talking about nude modeling at this point or just like regular, like what kind of modeling were you doing then? At this point, I was just doing like glamour, lingerie. I think the most I would get was topless. Okay. I wasn't like fully committed to getting nude or even doing any type of um, erotic Was it even on your radar yet? It really wasn't. Okay. Um, It was probably a few months into it that you know, I started getting inquiries for it. And so that's when I was like, oh, if I'm going to like, you know, up my career as a model, this is something that I likely need to add to my, you know, repertoire is nude modeling Mm -hmm. and then erotic modeling. It took me a minute to get my head wrapped around it because I don't know, for whatever reason, I just couldn't (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, conceptualize it's, it. It's a big step, right? Yeah. And it's like, it's one of those things that you can't come, you yeah. can't really come back from. Like, it'll always like be, can't. especially with the internet, it'll always be out there. Yeah. And so that's kind of like always had in the back of my mind that, you know, modeling may not be my end all be all. So, mm-hmm. you know, I tried to tread lightly with that. But I did end up doing nude modeling and erotic and ended up enjoying it, having a lot of fun, meeting some really cool um, producers and photographers. Um, And then I started getting offers for fetish modeling, which was kind of like the nude scene all over again. Like, Mm -hmm. what in the world? Mm -hmm. Like, you want to tie me up Mm -hmm. (laughs) as a bondage model and I'm supposed to act like a damsel in distress for the camera. I had a hard time conceptualizing that one as well. (laughs) (laughs) But um, no, I ended up uh, doing that. So I started with like bondage modeling and I was like, oh, interesting. So this is working out for me. And um, yeah, just kind of led into doing more fetish modeling along with the glamour and nude stuff. Um, And then I started working with female domination fetish producers and that's when I kind of had this epitome of like, whoa. That's this when you is felt really like this, this is like, <laughs> this is what I was meant to do. Yeah. Cause I always had that like emptiness, I feel like inside of me that was like, I do enjoy what I'm doing, but I felt like there was a niche I was meant to be part of. Mm-hmm. I just didn't know what it was. Mm-hmm. And so whenever I found out about female domination, like it all clicked like had this crazy realization that like this is kind of the direction that I want to go. So it was about, you know, I would say a year into my modeling. It was right around FetishCon 2023 um, that I made the decision that I wanted to start making my own female domination clips through my own production company. Um, And they're all solo point of view. And most of them I'm clothed, not nude. Because I realized that's the biggest fetish of it all is being clothed and not allowing them to see you naked. I was going to say it's that kind of, um, uh, what's the word, like um, denial, right? Right. It's like you don't deserve to see me naked. Yeah. Yeah. And so shortly after coming out with my femdom clip, I started getting like floods of requests for in-person sessions. And I was like, hmm. 
I was a little hesitant at first, more from just a safety aspect. Mm -hmm. But I guess it kind of goes, it's similar to like being a sugar baby or an escort. You know, there's always that safety concern Mm -hmm. of meeting someone. Did you do like any kind of screening? Like how would you make sure that you were going into a safe situation? Yeah. After I decided that I would start trying in-person sessions, it came up with a screening process. And so it's still the same screening process I use now. I always make um, the submissive send an initial tribute to show that they're serious. Once they've done that, um, I ask them what they're looking for in a session to make sure it's something that I offer. And then if it is, we discuss dates. I tell them what it's going to cost. They send a deposit. And at the same time, I also get a copy of their ID. So I've got their legal name, address, all of that. And so I will just normally do like a Google search, um, sometimes check out their social media so I can see more about their personal lives. I've considered and tried a background check service, but for, for what I'm doing, um, this has worked out pretty well for me, mm-hmm. not having to go the full way with a background checking service. Do they come to you or do you go to them? My subs. <clears throat> oh, they always come to me. They come to you. Yeah, I never reach out to anyone. No, but I mean, sorry, the location. I live in the Tampa Bay area. Mm-hmm. And so I have a, I call it my studio slash dungeon because okay. I film, shoot modeling stuff and do my in-person sessions there. And it's in St. Petersburg, which is like a little mini fetish capital of um, the United States. Mm-hmm. And so it's turned out really well for me. Um, but yeah, I normally don't do out call sessions. And if I do, I charge a whole lot more for it. Right. It makes sense that you would have your own place because then, you know, it's it's your place. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you have some kind of like security system, whether it be oh, the yes. person there or whatever it may <laughs> uh-huh. be, to make sure that you're not just going to like disappear. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I've got cameras all on the exterior and like part of the like background check or safety protocol that I use is make them ring the ring doorbell so that captures their face mm-hmm. in case anything goes amiss. And But yeah, so all of that combined, and here we are now, still modeling, um, but primarily doing dominatrix work and creating clips right now. You said that like when you first tried this, you felt like, okay, this is what I like to do. Had you ever experimented with that in your personal life before mm-hmm. trying it in this kind of professional environment? Or was it really like a tried it first time and, oh, this clicked? Yeah, this was really first time trying any of it. Like my partner, previous partner's current partner would just like play, have like kinky fun in the bedroom. But I was always attracted to dominant men. So I never once thought like I wanted Mm -hmm. to be the dominant, whether in the bedroom or just in a lifestyle situation. And so that's what like was really like eye opening to me because I had a lot of fun doing it in these fetish clip scenarios and in, you know, scenes with submissives in person. But yeah, it was my first time. And I think my first clip was about chastity. And I looked at the producers like, what is chastity? Like, what does that even mean? And I got it like right away, but I was just so like, shocked for a moment. It's like, wait, (laughs) guys are actually into this. This is wild. So can you explain that for the audience? Mm -hmm. Because some people may not, may also not know what that is. So chastity, it is a device and it is a cage that goes around your penis and it's meant to lock your penis up so that you cannot touch it or masturbate. And basically, a lot of the times you will hand the keys over to your dominatrix or your dominant um, in that dynamic. And so they have full control over, you know, your penis. And uh, they also make them for females. But, you know, my experience is mainly with males. So, And then is that just for that particular session or do you have situations where they wear it at home as well? Yeah. So I do... We're, you know, both of them. Some people just want to experience it in a session. Um, But yeah, some want to go to the extreme. And so 
Beyond chastity, we call that key holding, where you hold their key for a set period of time. Um, and so, you know, some doms will have you sign a contract. Um, I don't. I'm just like, send me your key, send me X fee for whatever length of period that we decide on. Um, but yeah, I've held someone's keys for up to like three months and then sent them back to them. But how do they pee? There is a hole for them <laughs> <laughs> to do that. Yeah. Do they have to like clean it? Does it like they, get, do they get, yeah. I would just imagine like I accidentally know. getting pee. I know. You're like, that's not my I know. <laughs> I know. I am really big into like health and keeping it clean. So like depending on the dynamic, uh, if they don't send me their key and like they hold it, uh, I would do like, you know, weekly Skype where you can take it off for like five minutes to clean it and I wash them clean it. Um, some of the guys don't want to clean it or they have their own like protocol on cleaning it. So mm. everyone's a little different, but yeah, if it's a dynamic where I'm in full control and like, yeah, we're cleaning that because that's disgusting. Mm -hmm. And then when they take it off, do they, I guess it depends on the guy, right? But mm -hmm. generally do they get to masturbate then or are they, <laughs> they just take it off and they still like don't get that final release. My biggest thing and like a common theme throughout all of my work is denial. So no, when they take it off, I don't let them orgasm. They can stroke and then it gets into the fetish of gooning, mm -hmm. which is another big fetish. Which is something too. I learned recently yeah. when I, so I joined Sex Panther Yeah, and I learned it on there. I had never heard of it before. <laughs> It is a new term, and so it's edging, but it's a prolonged edging yeah. session, and it's almost like the submissive is getting into this trance-like state yeah. where they just go completely blank, and all they can do is stroke, and they're watching your videos or talking with you and consuming your content. But yeah, no, it's a new word and kind of this new trend, I think, mm -hmm. in the last couple of years in the femdom space. But yeah, so if you go from chastity with me, I will just turn you into a gooner after that where you'll be stroking, but you're not going to come. I mean, they don't, they never get to come? <laughs> On occasion, but normally if they do, I'll make them pay like this super high cum tax. Cum tax? <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that plays into the financial domination aspect, which I do a lot of as well. Yeah, I definitely want to hear about financial domination because <laughs> that's something that people are always fascinated by. Mm -hmm. And I've learned over the years talking to different women who do it, it's not as easy as one would think. But let's take a quick commercial break and then we'll come back. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the one time that you were hired to kidnap a submissive. <laughs> I heard that that's a really good story. <laughs> and like maybe some crazy customs because those are always really interesting. So stick around, guys. We'll be right back. All right, guys, let's talk hygiene, something that's incredibly important in my line of work. As a director in the adult industry, I've learned a ton about keeping things well clean. The performers I work with are absolute pros, and they've taught me that great hygiene isn't just a must on set. It's a lifestyle. And that's where my secret weapon comes in, tushy. Now, I'm talking about the Tushy Bidet. This thing is a game changer. Imagine the difference between wiping with toilet paper, ugh, smearing it around, not cute, versus washing with a precise stream of fresh water that removes 99% of bacteria. Yeah, it's that much better. It's like upgrading from a regular hotel room to the penthouse suite for your butt. And have you seen my butt? It's amazing. And it deserves only the best treatment. Plus, let's talk about convenience. Look, I don't have time for complicated installations, and thankfully, Tushy gets that. The Tushy bidet easily attaches to your existing toilet. No extra plumbing, no electricity, no fuss. You can set it up in literally 10 minutes. Anyone can do it. If I can do it, trust me, you can do it. I am not very handy. And if there's someone special in your life that deserves the gift of hygiene, then give the gift of practical luxury that benefits everyone in your household. For a limited time, our listeners get 10% off of their first bidet order when you use code HOLLY at checkout. That's 10% off of your first bidet order at hellotushy.com with promo code HOLLY. And don't forget to give us a shout out when you're there and let them know that we sent you. Go to hellotushy.com for the best gift this holiday season. 
All right, guys, we are back. So yeah, we kind of teased the financial domination kink before we took a break. So tell us about that. Yeah. So anyone that doesn't know, financial domination is a fetish within the BDSM world and particularly normally falls into the female domination fetish where the submissive relinquishes control over their finances. Um, And there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. But basically, they get off to either sending you money, sending you gifts, um, spoiling you, but they just get off to relinquishing that financial control to their dom. I know so many people who hear this and go, oh, I want to do that. Like, Mm -hmm. that sounds easy, right? Yeah. And it's not, right? I mean, it's hard to find people that are truly into financial domination where they will actually give you money or that kind of control. Right. Um, A lot of times they just want to talk about it, but not actually Mm -hmm. spend the money. So how, like how many of these kinds of clients have you had and Mm -hmm. how successful have those been? Yeah. So getting into the not easy, it is a very, it is very much trending, like I guess all over social media, financial domination. And so a lot of these people don't believe it's sex work. Mm-hmm. which I find funny because it is because mm-hmm. your sub is getting off sexually. But yeah, I've had a lot of clients into it. And so a lot of my financial domination play is online. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of tougher to do it in person. And most of these guys don't even have the guts to see you in person. So they want to do it online. Mm-hmm. Generally, it's very rare that you're going to actually just get a submissive that is just going to send you money just to send you money or gifts. Normally, always, you're pairing it with another fetish. Um, like for me, for example, one big fetish that I always pair it with and that a lot of my clientele is into is gooning. So they're in that trance-like state, stroking and stroking and stroking. And so their mind is fuzzy, kind of like melting away. And then that's when the financial domination aspect really kicks in because they're in subspace. And so all they want to do is please you and get off to you. And so then you have them start sending and sending and sending. But I think that's just kind of a misconception with financial domination that you're going to find subs just sending you money out of nowhere without any expectation. Um, It's very, very rare. But yeah, in that case, I've only had a handful that just send and then don't do anything else because at the end of the day, they are getting off to it sexually. So they are, there is an expectation there to have something in return Mm -hmm. from sending you money, Mm -hmm. whether it's small or large. And then do you find that they kind of like come and go easily? Because I've had a couple of guys Mm -hmm. reach out to me and want to do that, which I remember there was this one guy in particular, I was like arguing with him. I'm like, I am not the right person for this. This is like not what I do. And I was like, I really don't want your money. And he was like, please. And I'm finally like, I was like, okay, fine. And then, and then he like vanished like after like two days. Yeah. So that's a common thing in financial domination is that they do vanish, they run away. And so one thing about it is whenever you get the submissives that are in that headspace and want to participate, is you just have to drain them hard and drain them quick because 95, if not higher, percent of them will vanish. Some you'll never hear from again. Generally, they'll come back like once every few months, but like it's just a common thing. Mm. A lot of doms talked about it and experienced it, and I have seen it time and time again with my submissives. It's to a point now where my bigger clients like – We'll have a really big drain or month um, of draining. And so then they'll disappear. Like they think that they want to get better. And they probably stop. need to make their money back. <laughs> and they want to make their money back. <laughs> and so like then they'll reappear like two yeah. or three months later. And they're like, I just couldn't resist it. Like this turns me on so much. And like yeah. they can, it's this really nasty cycle that they get into because they're so addicted to it. But then like after a big drain happens or maybe they come like this clarity starts to sink in and they're like, yeah, I've got to I've got to get out of this or else I'm going to be ruined forever. 
So it's just this nasty cycle that most of these fin subs are in. Mm-hmm. And it's just a common thing. <laughs> oh my God, that's crazy. Oh, yeah. So tell us about um, some of your more interesting customs. Um, yeah. From what I understand, you you do quite a few of them. And you're on mm-hmm. loyal fans, right? Like you're actually not on OnlyFans. Yeah, I am just exclusively on loyal fans. Um, I made that switch late last year. I didn't feel like my fan base was connecting with me in the way that I wanted them to on OnlyFans. Plus, I just don't agree with a lot of the higher up um, decisions being made there. And I know that they're taking down a lot of fetish content. Yeah. I even saw it with some of my own content before I deleted it. It was getting taken down. Problems with model releases and whatnot. Um, But yeah, so loyal fans made that transition and it's just such a better platform for me. I will always recommend it and prefer it. Um, But yeah, so... I get customs from loyal fans, emails, like I want clips, all the stuff, but the craziest customs, oh my goodness. So I have two that were just absolutely wild. And these actually kind of came in like before I was even doing like female domination. Um, one was this guy wanted me to reenact a drowning scene. So I had to go like rent an Airbnb with a pool because I didn't have access to one. And like I was supposed to act like I was drowning the entire time. Like, (gasps) oh my God. (laughs) Looking back at it, like, oh my God, it was so heinous. Um, But he loved it. And I was so uncomfortable doing it. That was kind of like when I first really started modeling. Yeah. Um, It was insane. I was like, wait, this is a fetish? And apparently it is. So I remembered that kink. So one of my best friends when I first started shooting, and she actually lived with me for a while, was a model named Aria Giovanni. Mm -hmm. And she used to do um, a lot of work for kink. And they used to have this like... Uh, what was called water bondage. Oh, and it's yes. essentially a tank mm-hmm. that they would fill up with water all the way to the top. Uh-huh. And then you'd be submerged in it. And then like the kink was to watch you struggle in mm-hmm. this water. And obviously like there was like, you'd make some kind of signal right. and then like the drain would open and it would like drain super, super mm-hmm. fast. Cause I remember her telling me about this and I was like, girl, that's crazy. That's yes. so dangerous. But they had yeah. it set up in a way that it was, you know, it, it right. was not. Um, it was safe. And she used to do that like quite a bit. And yeah, I no. never heard of it. Yeah, I found out about that at the, one of the fetish cons is like talking to some of the fetish models, like they actually specialize in water bondage. And I'm like, oh no, that's just too much for me. <laughs> I don't want to do anything with water uh and going under there and being bound and not having yeah. free will to get back up. Yeah. But yeah, it is water bondage drowning. I don't know how big of a fetish it is, but it's clearly big enough that people are like seeking content. Whatever it is, there's a fetish for it, right? Like I always say that. And actually, we were talking about Clips for Sale earlier, right? which was like the original fetish clip site. Mm -hmm. And if you ever wanted to find some weird kinky, just go on there, look at the categories. And there was some (laughs) wild shit on there. Oh, and there still is. It is very kinky. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that was one of them. What was another one? Yeah, this was last year. I had a guy reach out and his fetish was sploshing. What's that? So sploshing is where you get really messy with like food. It can Mm. be any food. Some people have a fetish of dessert. Like this guy's fetish was with pie. (laughs) <laughs> oh, it's my favorite. The pie in the face fetish. It's yes. my favorite. Yeah, you were talking I about love that. It. It's yeah. So wild. It really is. And so, like, he told me exactly how he wanted it. Like, clearly, he's done this several times. He's like, You're going to go to the store, you're going to get paper plates and, you know, just the graham cracker crust pies, and you're going to get shaving cream. And whipped cream, because I want to see both, because they give, like, a different effect. And, like, he wanted me to pie myself in the face over a hundred times. And then... So you're, like, just doing this? Like, within three minutes. Wait, a hundred times in three minutes? (gasps) I know, I was... (laughs) <laughs> Could you even breathe? No. And so I started hyperventilating. It was terrible. <laughs> I was like, 
Oh no, my it God. was crazy. I was like, oh my goodness. Like, like yeah, so his fetish was like really pie. yeah, fast sploshing with pies. And it was the most bizarre thing ever. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't see. It was crazy. But yeah, that was wild. I won't be doing that one again. That has become one of my hard limits. <laughs> That's like when your nose. Yeah, I'm like, oh my goodness. So did you happen to do a hundred pies? Yeah. And, um, what was it? Three minutes? Yeah. It was so intense. Where did you get that many pies? That's why he wanted like, he wanted like 80% like paper plates and 20 pie crusts. So like I had to have help. And so what I did was- assembly line of fucking like pies. I did. And so I had someone behind the camera. I had already pre-made all the pies with all the whipped cream and shaving cream. So I had to go to like five different grocery stores that day. And, you know, these people are looking at me as I check out. Like, this is like a, is this is like a great deal? BTS moment. Like, in my <laughs> head, I'm just, like, seeing the behind the scenes. And yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. One lady, because being in Florida in a small town, she's like, honey, what are you doing with all that? You into some kinky shit. I was like, oh <laughs> she my knew. God. She's like, she's you're like, not the first pie <laughs> splashing fetish girl like, oh to come my, my way. Gosh, I was <laughs> so embarrassed. <laughs> But yeah, I had an assembly line of pies. Someone behind the camera was like, boom, 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 boom. It was so crazy. And then I was just getting attacked by mosquitoes because we filmed it at night because you wanted it to be dark outside. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> and no. so I was like, I ended up with like 30 bug bites, <laughs> pie up my nostrils and my ear holes, any hole possible it was in. Through the crevices of my teeth oh for my days, god. I was still finding oh pie my on myself. I was like, oh my god. Do you find disgusting. yourself like not able to eat pie now? Oh yeah. I mean, it's I'm a sweet girl. I okay. love anything sweet. But yeah, I kind of have stayed away from pie for a little bit. It's gotta be like <laughs> pie without whipped cream at this point. Like a good crumble, like a fruit right, crumble. Yeah, exactly. A pecan pie or something, <laughs> but nothing with whipped cream. You better get that away from me. I won't even consume whipped cream anymore after that. I'm like, I'm over it. Oh my God, that's yeah. wild. Yeah. Yeah, the pie in the face fetish is like, I don't know why that, for me, when I saw that, I was just like, what the fuck is this? That's what I saw. I was like, who the fuck is into this? But they are. A lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people. I remember, um, like, uh, I think it was uh, Aaliyah Love told me about mm-hmm. a custom she did with Shiloh Jennings. And, like, they, the guy wanted them to get all dressed up, hair and makeup, yes. gown, everything, and then just fucking throw pies Oh, I them. know. It's <laughs> so bad. A lot of them do have that. They want you to look super glam and pretty. It's and then like, just destroy you with pie. I know. I'm like. I can't. I can't. I always like want to know where these fetishes come from. I know. You know, because it's from some like something they experienced in childhood or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. I generally always ask my subs if it's a weird fetish, but like at this point, I didn't even think to do that. I was just like, do they tell you, like, have you ever gotten like an interesting story from a sub about why they wanted a specific custom? Yeah. So another custom I had being a a femdom now was this guy like from the UK was like, I want you to make a video and on the video, you're going to have pictures of my sister on it. And he sent all these pictures and um, you were going to humiliate her because she could never be a dominant, powerful woman like you. You're going to talk about how much money you make, how much little she makes. He gave me all this information on her. I think we know why. <laughs> yeah, I was like, why he Whoa. wants that. <laughs> yeah, and he just was like, I've just been, I from an early age, I hated her, but then seeing how she never did anything with her life, and I'm just so into it. I'm like, okay, what happened? Wow. Here you go. Here's the price. Pay me. We'll do it. We're done. So wait, hold on. Okay. So is it like, are you like sitting on the floor and there's like pictures of his sister all over no. you? Around you? Is it in a frame and you're like talking to a, <laughs> a framed photo? Like how is this working? Yeah, no, he was specific. He wanted them like on the video. Like, so I okay. had to go into Adobe Pro and like snip the pictures and place them around me as I'm okay, the so this is done in editing. Yeah, and I would okay. be pointing, and <laughs> yeah, it's all done in editing, and it was so freaking weird. But all of my subs, like I would say, ninety percent, it all stems from childhood and a 
a parent or family member got yeah. them into the fetish. Yeah. And I'm like, that's so weird. Yeah. I mean, it makes it's crazy, sense. crazy, though. Yeah, it, it makes sense because a lot of times it's like the few people that I've spoken to have fetishes for certain things. Mm -hmm. It's like it maybe occurred at that transitional moment of adolescence, right? Yeah. When they're starting to have that early sexual awakening. Right. And something happens that like triggers it and then it just stays with them. Exactly. It, like imprints on them. I know. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah. That is amazing. Uh-huh. So – you have another um, very interesting, I guess, custom, or I don't know, maybe this was just a a job, but you were once hired to kidnap a s submissive <laughs> in Florida. Can you yeah. tell us how you pulled that one off? Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, this is, yeah, an in-person session, and the guy contacted me. He's like, my fetish is getting kidnapped. And I had, like, done, like, virtual, like, role play with him before. I'd never done an in-person session of kidnapping. And I was like, what am I going to do? Like, because he wanted to get kidnapped in, like, the middle of St. Petersburg. I'm like, how am I going to do this with cops all around? And, like, I swear, officer, he wanted it. I know. <laughs> I'm like, this is such a fine line. I really have to plan this out so, like, I don't get in trouble. Don't go to jail. <laughs> He gets what he wants. Right. And after a lot of like thinking about it and like figuring out the best solution, <laughs> I have this like St. Petersburg is weird. Like all the neighborhoods look kind of sketchy. That's just like Florida in general, I guess. But like the neighborhood my dungeon is in is kind of sketchy. And like all the neighbors just kind of like leave you alone. But my dungeon like borders this alley that probably is like a quarter of a mile long. It's like, okay, first time we're doing this, like, and he wanted me to film it all. And he was like, I want you to film it all. And I want you to be the only kidnapper. And I was like, no, we can't do this. I was like, I got to have someone driving the car. I was like, you're 300 pounds, like six, five. There's no way I'm going to be able to throw you into the car because <laughs> you want to be like tossed in the car. Oh my God. <laughs> and you want me to film it holding it in my hand, like, come on now. And so, like, I had to have help. A henchman, we called it. We planned it out. We have him walking down the alley. We're driving around the neighborhood, and, like, we come up behind him, and, like, I'm like, get in the car, motherfucker. And we, like, I had to come up with this whole scenario as to, like, why I was kidnapping him. And it was because he, like, owed me money or something. Mm -hmm. um, and if he didn't pay up, then, you know, he was going to get in big time trouble. <laughs> so, like, we're driving him around and then we take him to this, like, abandoned warehouse in St. P and, like, toss him around there for a few minutes. So, wait. So, did you have to tie him up before you put him in the car? Or did you just, like, yeah. put so, him like, in? Yeah. So, to make it quick so nobody saw because, like, all the neighbors are, like, literally sitting outside because they call it the front porch community. Yeah. <laughs> I had to like think quickly. So I like zip tied him really quick and like we shoved him in the car in like less than 15 seconds. All while filming it too. I don't know how I managed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then once he got in the car, like he had a, he has a fetish on top of that of being tied up with like silk scarves. Okay. And so I had to have the silk scarves ready to tie his mouth and his eyes and the rest of his body. Um, and so... Luckily, once he got in the car, you know, with tinted windows, it was fine. But like, yeah, I was like so nervous because like, oh, my God, what if somebody <laughs> sees this? And I was like, we're driving around. There was a cop behind us at one point. I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> like, they're going to pull us over. So I had to have him like sign this waiver and everything before we even got started. I was like, I don't even know if a cop would like take me seriously, like presenting all this. I might just end up at, behind bars. But <laughs> No, luckily that didn't happen. But yeah, so then I had to get him back to my dungeon and tied him up in all these different positions. And, you know, we had, I played into the element of financial domination. Like, you're going to give me your debit card pin code if you want to get out of here. And then I was sending myself money from his phone, um, you know, to make up for all the money that he supposedly owed me. And so it took a lot of planning. It's a four hour long session. Yeah, it was intense. Wow. And he's like dying to do it again. He's like, I want to come back like in two weeks or whatever. I'm like, I'm really busy with like traveling right now. I was like, okay. 
Oh my God. Yeah. So how did you like end it? Because oh, I feel like the, like the anti, like, did you end it in the same way where he'd given you enough money and so you untie him and you like mm -hmm. throw him out into the street? Yeah. Or was it like, okay, your four hours is over. Like, here you go. <laughs> just untie you. Would you like some water? Like, No, I know. <laughs> yeah. So I ended it like I untied him and, and I made him like, he was still like blindfolded or something. I made him like crawl like outside, just like kind of my studio has like this backyard. And so you're going to crawl outside, you're blindfolded and like, there you go, escape. Mm -hmm. And then like before we started though, it was like at the end of the scene, you know, obviously come back in here because all your stuff is in here. But like to end the <laughs> scene, I was like, there you go. Find your way home. Did you dare tell anyone about this? Or mm -hmm. you're, you're done. And so, yeah, he like crawled outside and then made his way back inside. And it was just like, yeah, and that's a tough scenario to like find an ending, right? Because it feels yeah. like weirdly anticlimactic. Because right. you like you did this whole setup; it's like a four-hour thing. Yeah, you throw him outside, and then it's like thirty seconds later, he just like strides in, like, "Hey, that was great. Thanks a lot." You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I it feels to transition back to real life after that feels weird. It does. Yeah, it was. It's strange, and like some sessions are like that. I'm mm -hmm. like trying to find a proper ending, but yeah. then. You know, some people want aftercare and mm -hmm. they want to discuss the session. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's like a fine line figuring that one out. <laughs> yeah. So um, you've also had some experiences at photo shoots. And I, mm -hmm. I think this is probably early in your career, I, yes. is my guess, yeah. that just ended up being like a guy with a camera, as we call yeah. it, GWCs. GWC. What was that like? Yeah, I would say like most of my experiences model you know, like at least 50% of the people that were paying me were just GWCs. Yeah. A lot of them expected that, you know, you were going to fuck them afterwards. I'm like, mm, honey, no, you're not even going to touch me. Like I always like came in hot. It was like, you're not touching me. Like I'm here professionally, all of this. But like one was hilarious. And especially when I first started, I always like brought an escort. And so this one, I brought my husband mm -hmm. and, um, we get there and the guy was like, okay, I'm ready. And he's got like soft boxes in these boxes. Cause he's like, I just went to the store. I just bought this camera and I just bought these lights. This is would be my first photo shoot ever. And he was like paying for like spread legs, solo masturbation or something. Mm -hmm. like, and he's like, but I don't know how to work the camera and I don't know how to put up the lights. <laughs> so I'm going to need help with that. And I was like, well, do you think I know how to do this? Because I don't. Luckily, my husband, who is a photographer, was like, are you fucking kidding me? So I was like, yeah, all right, here we go. Let's set all of this stuff up for him. And he's like, well, wait a minute. Why don't you both just get in the in front of the camera and just film a boy girl for me? And then maybe I'll get involved. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh my god but yeah i'm like that is so bad you don't even know like you just bought the camera on lights you don't even know how to operate it but sadly that's the thing i've had that so i used to do workshops and one of the things that yeah like first of all when i started i had to be super clear and give like a very strict lecture about how and even before the guys came to the session like there will be no open leg right. you are not going to have sex with the model <laughs> you are not going to act inappropriately i will throw you out like you have to know how to work your camera and honestly to be fair like 90 percent of the guys that came to our workshop were awesome um but there's always like that one guy i had quite a few that had no idea how to <laughs> operate their camera that was pretty common which is okay right yeah. they want to learn that's fine it's tricky and then there was like this one guy it's actually kind of to think about. I only did a few workshops. I did maybe like six or something, but there was only one guy I really had a problem with who I guess like, you know, I had to talk to a couple of times. And then like once when I walked away from the set to go to the bathroom or something, he tried to like get the girl to do more. And <laughs> yeah, I had to like so come back bad. and like really give him. Yeah. Cause it's like, you're not here to date. What are you doing? Why do they all, like, I don't know why all these GWCs, I think it's like, they just don't want to go downright, like, pay for an escort. So they're like, I'm just going to pay a pretty girl to come nude modeling for me. And since she'll be nude, she'll just want to spread her legs and get some of, like, that's yeah. not how it works. Yeah, there's a, the there's, majority. A lot of, there's a lot of guys who want to get into photography shooting nude models because mm -hmm. they think that's their way into, like, 
Yeah. Getting laid. Right. Getting laid. And there's always, always, I would have, well, I can make you successful on OnlyFans now. And if you work with me, I'm going to make turn you into a star. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Bye. (laughs) And that's such a common thing, too, with them. They're like, yeah, I'm going to make you a star. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, we women generally have a good radar and yeah, we we can we can sense if you've got an ulterior motive. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk about uh, the influence that the adult industry has on the mainstream industry. Mm-hmm. Do you think that sex work has impacted fashion and culture? Yeah, absolutely. Like especially you know being dominatrix, so wear some latex and leather and all of that, like kind of dominant, powerful looking things. Like I watch a lot of reality TV in my downtime, and so like. Even just yesterday, I noticed like one of the housewives was wearing like this old latex outfit. And so I think the adult industry has had a say like in fashion, some pop culture as well. Like I watch quite a few TV shows where they're like talking about fetish and BDSM scenarios and um, I find it very interesting. But I think there's definitely some influence there. I mean, I'd like to see even more influence. Do you feel like the mainstream industry often gets the adult industry wrong? And what do you wish that people knew about the adult industry that you feel is a big misconception? Yeah, they do. There's a lot of misunderstanding. And not everyone that's in the adult industry is just a downright whore. I think like a lot of the times people think, oh, if you're a porn star or dominatrix or whatever you are, like you're just a slut and all you want is to get laid. And it's like, at the end of the day, we may enjoy that. Obviously, I enjoy a lot of my work, but it is our career. Like this is, we chose just a different career path than you. And I think a lot of people don't realize like, you know, there's quite a few people in this industry, including myself, that it's like, Outside of work, it's like I'm married, I have a normal life. Um, I don't think that they understand or grasp that we are normal people as well as porn stars and adult stars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't quite get the correlation. A lot of people just can't understand it. Yeah. Um, That brings me to the question of your husband. Mm -hmm. So you guys met while you were sugaring, as you Mm -hmm. said, and you're still together. He might even be in the next room. (laughs) Hi. (laughs) So tell me, like, how does that dynamic work? Yeah. Obviously, he supports your career. Yeah, no. He has been supportive from the start. Um, I would not be sitting here without him, if I'm being completely honest. And he helps me manage a lot of, like, the business aspects of what I do, from, like, the financial aspect to the legal matters of, like, DMCA notices and, you know, all the filings for the companies. I'm like, I don't even want to grasp this information. All the boring corporate you know? paperwork, which is yes. a big part of it is being really a, big part. a sex worker. Because the thing is that I think a lot of people don't understand, like, you are essentially a small business owner and an entrepreneur. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And so... He helps me run a lot of that, some of my administrative tasks he also helps me with because I feel very spread thin a lot of the times, Um, you know, doing sessions, filming content, customs, still doing shoots and, you know, going to conventions and events. And so like to be able to have help and support and a lot of people use an agency, I just happen to do it kind of like in-house. And Mm -hmm. so very supportive. Our dynamic works really well, I think, because we met before I started doing this. Um, I think it would just be different, you know, Mm -hmm. had we met and I was already an adult star, but it's so helpful and refreshing to have a supportive partner because I know in this industry, it can be really tricky. Mm -hmm. (laughs) A lot of jealousy and things like that, but no. We make it work very well. So I'm very thankful for that. You also have a full-sized sex doll releasing this fall. What was the experience like getting molded for that? And what is the process? So yeah, it was an AVN this year. I um, met the people that are doing the sex doll and it's Iron Tech Dolls. Um, 
the process first. You know, you have to discuss all the business aspects, like, you know, what it's going to cost, what you're getting paid, everything like that. Um, once that's all figured out, contract is signed. They had me go to three different like body scanning um, places because they needed like all these different very intricate body scans because this particular sex doll is supposed to be like a 99% identical replica to me. Um, It's supposed to be very advanced compared to some of the other companies out there. So um, we had to scan each body part separately from my fingers and nails to my feet to, you know, my lady parts, uh, my hair. They needed, you know, photos of everything as well, of the preferred makeup. Um, So, yeah, um, three different body scans, lots of like raw natural photos later. And they really wanted to perfect it. It was supposed to come out actually uh, a couple months ago, but, you know, they kind of were finalizing some details. But I just actually got word earlier this week that it is done. So in the next month or two, it will be available for purchase. Have you seen it yet? I have seen it. Like, I am shook. It looks just like me. Oh, my God. (laughs) Do you get to have a copy for yourself? Yeah. So they're actually sending me the first one. And so I'm like, where am I going to put this bitch in my house? At the dinner table? how odd. I'm going to scare myself with it because I don't at the dinner table and I like walk in one night like, ah! I just, I'm just thinking of all like the viral TikTok videos that you can do. Yeah, no, like, I have, I've also thought of that. I'm like, that would be such a rape. Custom and custom. Oh yeah. I'm going to put her up at my studio or my dungeon and like oh do God. sessions with her. Like Ugh. you don't even deserve to lick my feet. You're going to lick her feet. Oh my God. <laughs> the yes. the like spring of creativity that has come yeah, from Yeah, no, there's a lot of good ideas brewing to do with it, but it's exciting. It looks just like me, which is scary, but cool at the same time. Wow. Yeah. And then does it like, it probably has that really realistic feeling like It skin does. Like the and- skin looks very realistic like the eyelashes the hair and then how do you clean it i don't know i think like whenever you buy something they send you like a manual on how you're supposed to clean it and take care of it for best use but yeah that's also that's a really good question because i'm like obviously there will be some uh, bodily fluid somewhere (laughs) like how are we getting those out of there i think that there's a compartment yeah take that out it's probably like the fleshlights where they like pull the sleeve out or something no i know but yeah i'm sure they've thought of it (laughs) i would i would hope so i know that they have (laughs) oh my god so and then last month you officially became a billboard model for loyal fans congratulations where can people see it Yeah, so I'm actually right after this headed to Las Vegas for the unveiling party tomorrow. Um, I don't know exactly when it's going to be unveiled. It was supposed to be unveiled today, but I would think tomorrow. Well, I'm not 100% sure. Anyway, I think by the end of this month, it's September. So yes, whatever the interstate is from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. So on your way to Las Vegas, before you get into the city, it's going to be around that area. They already have like another billboard out there. Um, So this will be their second one, but I'll be on there with four other girls. And so that's super exciting. I can't wait to see it. Billboard before? No. So when they uh, contacted me, I was like, well, yeah, I would have been a billboard. It's just another thing to add to my <laughs> like achievement. So it was like really exciting. So yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Well, congratulations. Thank you. It sounds like you've hit um, a lot of milestones, but do you have any other goals that you have yet to fulfill? Yeah, I have quite a few. Um, You know, I think the common and main goal is like, I love to be a household name, just like yourself within the adult industry and maybe in the mainstream world one day. Um, So by doing that, I love to um, get a few more magazine covers. So I'm already on the covers of Playboy and FHM and then a bunch of smaller ones. But like, I've always had this dream of like hitting the trifecta, being on the cover of Playboy, Hustler, and Penthouse. So that's something that I want to work towards. Um, I'm working towards the Hustler one right now. 
But yeah, I love to achieve that. And then another thing I'm working on and would love to achieve in the coming years is to get nominated and maybe hopefully win an XBiz or AVN award. And yeah, just continuing like to evolve and grow um, my brand, my presence in the industry. Um, and another like goal is to just work. I want to work with a select few, mm -hmm. but the right few of big production houses. Um, and I actually have a shoot tomorrow with one, so I'm super excited. This will be my biggest production house experience, and so it's going to be super Can you say, or is that under wraps until it's done? Um, I don't want to jinx myself, but I can't say who I'm shooting with because you okay. just had her on your podcast. I think she was in your... Um, art gallery thing okay. as well, Leah Gotti. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so I'm super excited to shoot with her. She seems She's like right a sweetheart. There. Yeah, okay, then yeah. <laughs> She's hanging on the wall right there. No, like, Hell yeah. <laughs> as soon as I found out and it was on your Instagram, I was like, oh my God, that's so exciting. She's but really sweet. Yeah, it would be super hot. It would be like femdommy uh, nice. girl girls. So nice. yeah, I'm very excited for that. Yeah. But yeah, that's kind of like just my overall goal is just becoming a bigger name um, within the adult industry. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I feel like you're well on your way there. Yeah. I've worked really hard to get to where I am today. So continue to put in the work to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Mm -hmm. It was such a pleasure to meet you and, and hear all your crazy stories. Yeah, no, definitely not for a lack of them. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure you're just going to continue to have more and more. Oh, I know. Yeah, right. Can you tell everyone where they can find you online? Yeah, so my website is ineedviolet.com. Um, that is if you want to inquire about sessions, you know, in the dominatrix world, or if you want to look at my modeling portfolio and then my loyal fans, you can find me at violets, V I O L E T S V I P.com. And that's like my main and only fan site. And that's where, you know, the single platform, you can really chat with me, um, and get to know me. And then, my Twitter is at I Need Violet. Um, that's my femdom Twitter. And so all the links to my other clip sites will be there and like, you know, wish lists and things of that nature all linked there. And then my modeling Twitter is XO Violet Voss. Um, but they're linked together. So if mm -hmm. you go to one, you'll find the other. And then my Instagram, poor thing. Always has trouble staying active. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah. Everybody basically. Right. Yeah. That one's at Violet Voss XO. And those are the main links. Fantastic. Yes. And then you guys can find me on Instagram at Holly Randall, on Twitter or X at Holly Randall as well. If you want to watch interviews like this streamed live, plus get access to bonus content, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered, or just go to hollylinks.com to get access to all of my platforms. I'm on a lot of them. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you on the next one.